The second part of chapter three lecture is uh, everything to do with phagos uh, phagocytes. So we're going to look at um, the two big ones in the innate immune system, and those are macrophages and neutrophils. Phagocytes, uh, by definition, are going to be cells that are involved in the engulfing and then subsequent killing of any pathogens that they bring in. And so any foreign invaders uh, that get into the tissue will be internalized and then destroyed. Macrophages are those resident cells that are pretty long lived and they are going to be present right at the beginning of an infection. They're going to be the first cells on the scene. Um, and then because of that, they have uh, the ability to send out a lot of inflammatory cytokines to tell other cells and to um, get other proteins involved. Neutrophils, on the other hand, circulate in the blood. They're only called up upon um, in an infection and they're very short lived. And so we're making billions of neutrophils every single day because they're only going to live for a few days. Um, they will not be in the tissues and they're only brought in when there is um, the call by the cytokines, the CXCL8. Neutrophils are the first effector population to be recruited um, and because, and that they rec they're recruited through that um, chemokine, that CXCL8. Okay, so here's a picture of, oops, maybe we can get over there. Here's a picture of the neutrophil. I love this picture. It's a one I found online because it kind of has a 3D look to it. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they're called polymorphonuclear cells because their nucleus can have many different shapes. And so you can see that it's lobed, like a mature neutrophil will have a very lobed nucleus. Anywhere from like three to five lobes is pretty common. Um, and so instead of saying polymorphonuclear um, nucleus, like leukocyte or cell, um, we will sometimes call them PMNs. And so you'll hear me use neutrophil and PMN interchangeably. Um, there's about 50 billion circulating in the blood at any given time. So it's a huge number. And you're not going to find them in the tissue, especially not going to find them in healthy tissue um, because they're only brought in when there is an infection. They're going to be the first ones recruited uh, by the macrophages. And so they are very much part of that inflammatory response. Once they gobble up and eat bacteria in an infected area, they die. That's their job. They come in and they die within a few hours of fake cytosis. And this is what's going to cause pus. So if you've ever had a scrape that has had like a pus that has formed, those are just dead neutrophils um, that are piling up. So when there's an infection, that pus is, is neutrophils. Kind of delicious, right? So here we have a schematic that shows neutrophils kind of just flowing through the blood. They are just, those 50 billion neutrophils are just going through the vesicles or through the vessels, just traveling along rapidly. Not, sometimes they'll touch the endothelial lining, but they're really not going to care too much. It isn't until the CXCL8 um, actually is produced and recognized by the neutrophils um, that they're going to slow down. Once that CXCL8 is out and um, available, and it's like an addressin, right? And the, C the CXCL8 receptor on the neutrophil then will engage and will slow down the neutrophil, and then it will start to roll. So it's called a slow and slow down and roll or slow and roll. And then they're gonna roll along that endothelial layer until they're able to go through diapedesis or entering the infected tissue through the endothelial lining. And so you have this, this fast movement here. Where are we at? You have fast movement down the blood vessel um, when there's no infection because you don't have any CXCL8 out on the endothelial um, surface. When, or when that CXCL8 is produced, so we have our infection down here, um, down in this uh, picture, we have the CXCL8 being produced by the macrophage. It's going to be on the endothelial lining. 
the CXCL8 receptor is on the surface of the neutrophil, that will engage, it will slow down the neutrophil, and then it goes through diapedesis, which is the squeezing of the neutrophil through the, the endothelial cells, and then they end up getting into the infected tissue, and that's when they can start doing their phagocytosis. So neutrophils are um, very eff effective at the work they do. They're going to um, engulf as much bacteria as they can, and then they're programmed to die. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough life for a neutrophil. So once they leave the blood and they enter the tissue, then their gene expression is going to change, and they're going to spend a lot of their energies making um, granules and toxic contents in, and superoxides in order to degrade anything that they do phagocytize. And so they're going to have complement receptors um, to pick up the C3B on the surface of any pathogens that have um, had complement um, activated on them because neutrophils love opsonins. Neutrophils have complement receptor that will recognize C3B. In other words, they just like condiments. They like a good tasty bacteria covered in C3B. So then what happens is you have that bacteria that has the complement receptors probably, or the complement, sorry, the C3B on the surface. They're going to be recognized by the neutrophil. They're going to be internalized through receptor-mediated endocytosis, just like what we saw with the macrophage. And then the granules are going to be added into the phagosome. So we have a variety of different granules that are going to be important in bacteria degradation. And then we have lysosomes that are going to contain um, superoxides um, that will further degrade and kill the bacteria until you have um, a huge vesicle full of nutrients that can be recycled. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, then what happens? Sorry. <laughs> then what happens? Is, so this is the big neutrophil here. Now we're panning way out in this next frame. And then that neutrophil, once it has spent up all of its granules and used up its lysosomes and destroyed the bacteria that has engulfed, it's going to die. And it's going to shrivel up into just a compacted little piece of garbage. And then the macrophage is going to gobble up the neutrophil. So, uh, because macrophages are going to be cleaning up and helping the tissue repair itself. So part of the killing of the bacteria inside of these phagolysosomes has to do with respiratory burst. And so these are these superoxides that I, I was talking about. Um, it's part of the neutrophils intracellular attack. And so you do have um, production of these superoxides that are very potent to bacteria and will um, degrade them. So hydrogen peroxide um, will rapidly kill a bacteria cell. And what's nice is then the cell produces catalase to then break down that hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water so that it's not no longer um, toxic after it has killed the bacteria. So respiratory burst, um, other toxic granules will help destroy any bacteria that have been um, engulfed. Now, another way that neutrophils um, can further help with the um, decreased spread of infection would be through this process called netosis. So not only is a neutrophil done killing or working when it dies, but it can actually go through this process called apoptosis. Okay, so a, a neutrophil will gobble up its bacteria and then will go through apoptosis where it starts to um, um, implode it on itself and then the macrophage can gobble it up or it can actually swell and it can burst and put out like almost like a net. And so it, the chromatin dissolves and it forms this trap of net-like substances, the sticky um, <laughs> thing with proteases and defensins, and then it can trap bacteria and kill the pathogens even after death. So really pretty cool. Um, and so this is called netosis. And here's a, a electron micrograph of that actually happening. And you can see how that bacteria is really trapped and it can't further disseminate throughout the body when it's in this um, process.
Okay. Um, we are going to go, yeah, just a few more slides here. Um, so these inflammatory cytokines, we've talked about IL-1B, we've talked about IL-6, and we've definitely mentioned TNF-alpha and about how they are all involved in increasing inflammation. Now, they are going to act in a very localized fashion so that inflammation doesn't become systemic, but rather it ends up being maintained where the infection is actually happening. Um, now, a raised body temperature, or what we call a fever, often is thought of as something we want to get rid of, right? We want to um, shut down a fever, but fever is actually really pretty great for the immune system because a higher temperature, A, isn't great for bacteria. Um, pathogens tend to like a little bit lower temperature, even a little bit lower than body temperature. Um, and so increasing the, the temperature of the body is actually going to slow down bacterial processes. Um, but also it will speed up the immune system's metabolism and uh, ability to produce cytokines. And so a raised body temperature can actually help fight um, infections. And then um, cytokines are, along with being pro-inflammatory and increasing the swelling and the heat and everything, they'll actually make the individual tired. And we, when we feel run down, that's our body saying, hey, you're going to be tired. You're going to sit and lay down and rest so that you can conserve energy that the immune system can then use to fight the infection. And so the body is not wasting its energy on other activities, but rather resting so that the immune system can take and, and use all of that energy to fight off infection. Okay, now the liver um, gets turned on and um, to well, the liver is always doing stuff, but an increase in the temperature is going to activate the liver then to make what we call acute phase proteins. And so here's a list of acute phase proteins that are um, increased when there is an infection. And so they're, they're produced by the liver, but we have a couple that are really um, big and that we talk about a lot. So C-reactive protein, also known as um, CRP, maybe you've heard this uh, ordered in a, uh, panel, like CRPs are, tend to be ordered to indicate inflammation. They're kind of a useless test actually, because they're very nonspecific. They're just, yeah, there is inflammation going on. That is one of them that we talk a lot about. Serum am amyloid A is another one that we um, talk a lot about uh, in the immune system. Um, but probably the most, well, C-reactive protein, we're going to come back to and um, serum amyloid A will come back to as well, um, but I just want to draw your attention to those. But we are going to spend more time talking about, I think I should have an arrow popping up here, uh, mannose binding lectin in this chapter. Okay. So just know um, that acute phase proteins are produced by the liver and they're produced when there is an infection. Um, and so when there's inflammation going on, then these proteins are produced. And we'll look at what that can lead to in the next lecture.